Chairman Heinrich, Vice Chairman Schweikert, members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this important hearing on artificial intelligence and its potential to fuel economic growth and improve governance. My name is Adam Thier, and I'm a senior fellow at the R Street Institute, where I focus on emerging technology issues. I also recently served as a commissioner on the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Commission on Artificial Intelligence, Competitiveness, Inclusion, and Innovation. Today, I will discuss three points relevant to this hearing. First, AI and advanced computational technologies can help fuel broad-based economic growth and sectoral productivity, while also improving consumer health and welfare in important ways. Second, to unlock these benefits, the United States needs to pursue a pro-innovation AI policy vision that can help bolster our global competitive advantage and geopolitical security. Third, we can advance these goals through an AI opportunity agenda that includes a learning period moratorium on burdensome new forms of AI regulations. I will address, address each point briefly, but I've included three appendices to my testimony for more details. AI is set to become the most important general purpose technology of our era, and AI could revolutionize every segment of the economy in some fashion. The potential exists for AI to drive explosive economic growth and productivity enhancements. While predictions vary, analysts forecast that AI could deliver trillions in additional global economic activity and significantly boost annual GDP growth. This would be over and above the four trillion of gross output that the US Bureau of Economic Analysis says that the digital economy already accounted for in 2022. But what really matters is what AI means to every American personally. AI is poised to revolutionize health outcomes in particular. AI is already helping with early detection and treatment of cancers, strokes, heart disease, brain disease, sepsis, and other ailments. AI is also helping address organ failure, paralysis, vision impairments, and much more. The age of personalized medicine will be driven by AI advancements. AI can help make government more efficient as well. Ohio Lieutenant Governor John Houston recently used an AI tool to help sift through the state's code of regulations and eliminate 2.2 million words of unnecessary and outdated regulations. Governor, uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom just announced an effort to use generative AI tools to improve public services and cut 8% from the state's government operations budget. And regulators are already using AI to facilitate compliance with existing policies, such as post-market medical device surveillance. AI also holds the potential to achieve administrative savings for federal health insurance programs, or better yet, reduce the number of people dependent on them by identifying and treating ailments earlier. There's an important connection as well between AI and broader national objectives. A strong technology base is a key source of strength and prosperity, so it is essential we do not undermine innovation and investment as the next great technology race gets underway with China and the rest of the world. Luckily, U.S. innovators are still in the lead. Had a Chinese operator launched a major generative AI model first, it would have been a veritable Sputnik moment for America. Still, China has made imperial ambitions clear, its imperial ambitions clear with the goal to become a global leader in advanced computation by 2030, and it has considerable talent data, and resources to power those ambitions. Experts argue that China's whole-of-society approach is challenging America's traditional advantages in advanced technology. We therefore need an innovation policy for AI that will not only strengthen our economy and provide better products and jobs, but bolster, bolster, bolster national security and allow our values of pluralism, personal liberty, individual rights, and free speech to shape global information markets and platforms. If, by contrast, fear-based policies impede America's AI developments, then China wins. To achieve these benefits that AI offers and meet the rising global competition, America needs what I call an AI opportunity agenda. An AI opportunity agenda begins with the reiterating the freedom to innovate is the cornerstone of American technology policy and the key to unlocking the enormous potential of our nation's entrepreneurs and workers. As part of this agenda, Congress should craft a learning period moratorium on new AI proposals, such as AI-specific bureaucracies, licensing systems, or liability schemes, all of which would be counterproductive and undermine our nation's computational cap capabilities. In addition, this moratorium should consider preempting burdensome state and local regulatory enactments that conflict with our national AI policy framework. Next, Congress should require our government's existing 439 federal departments and subdepartments to evaluate their current policies towards AI systems with two purposes in mind. First, to ensure that they are not overburdening algorithmic systems with outdated policies, and second, to determine how existing rules and regulations are capable of addressing the concerns that some have raised about AI. Taking inventory of existing rules and regulations can then allow policymakers to identify any gaps that Congress should address using targeted remedies. Finally, an AI opportunity agenda requires openness to new talent and competition. Experts are finding that with a talent war brewing between the US and China, China is moving ahead in some important ways and we must take steps to attract and retain the world's best and brightest. 
In sum, America's AI policy should be rooted in patience and humility instead of a rush to overregulate based on hypothetical worst case thinking. We're still very early in the AI life cycle. There's still no consensus on even how to define the term, let alone legislate beyond establishing definitions. I thank you for holding this hearing and for your consideration of my views. I look forward to any questions you may have. Crazy. Uh, Mr. Thier, um, what's my GDP growth? What's my, um, I have a personal fixation on where we are demographically as a country. We're getting old very fast. We often don't want to talk about it. The, we have to be brutally honest, 100% of the calculated future debt for the next 30 years. Interest, healthcare costs, and if a decade from now we backfill Social Security. It's demographics. What is your vision of AI, the growth, the labor substitution? Does it save us? Yeah, well, I, nothing can save us, but it, it, it can certainly make a major contribution towards the, 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 the betterment of our government processes and potentially our debt. Uh, there's been various estimates, Congressman, on exactly how much uh, AI could contribute to overall gross domestic product. Uh, the, the low end being something like at least 1.2% annually, but it goes up from there with uh, one forecast for 15.7 trillion. But I beg you to be slightly louder. Uh, 1.2% 1, 1. annually GDP uh, boost and 15.7 trillion potential contribution to global economy by 2030, according to another report. I have all this data in a supplement to my testimony. Uh, and again, the, the, the estimates vary widely. But the bottom line is that almost all economists, political scientists, and consultancies realize that this is a great a, you know, opportunities to once again build digital technology. What are the limits of explainability? What could we as lawmakers really demand in terms of explainability? Yeah, well, transparency is a good principle, but the question about how to mandate it by law is always tricky. And when you get specifically into algorithmic explainability, the question is exactly how do you explain all the inner workings of a model before it gets to market, right? That's very difficult. And what I've articulated in the, the 10 principles uh, to the AI task force that I sent up were basic to, on the back end, look at to try and to micromanage and figure out how explainable they are, quote unquote. Because I, I think that's a fool's errand. I don't think that can be done efficiently without innovation. As we look at the output, actually right balance. But thank you. Um, what do we mean by that? Like, how would you define that? Colorado has passed some um, regulations that even their governor uh, has, has questioned. And just using that as one example. What is it that we should be concerned about uh, in this framework? Certainly, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, first of all, as of noon today, there are 754 AI bills pending across the United States of America. 642 of those bills are at the state level. That does not include all the city-based bills. Probably the most important AI bill that's passed so far is New York City. Not New York State, New York City. And so there's patchworks and then there's patchworks, right? And so the, the, the cumbersome nature of all those compliance rules added on top of each other, even if well-intentioned, can be enormously burdensome to AI innovators and entrepreneurs. So that's just one thing to note. The other thing to note is that there's been discussions about the idea of like overarching new bureaucracies or you know, certain types of licensing schemes. I have no problem with existing licensing schemes as applied in, in, the, in the narrow focused areas where AI might be applied, whether it's medicine, you know, drones, driverless cars. But an overarching new licensing regime for all things AI is going to be incredibly burdensome. That's a European approach. We don't want that. And Senator, let me just say something about your China point, because this is really important. You know, we're here on June 4th. This is the 35th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. And when we talk about, like, you know, the importance of getting this right for America and our global competitiveness, it's important for exactly the reason you pointed out. Because if, if we don't and China succeeds, then they're exporting their va values, their surveillance systems, their censorship. The very fact that I just uttered the term Tiananmen Square at this hearing means it won't, this hearing won't be seen in China. I apologize for that to everyone else here. But the bottom line is that that means that what's at stake is geopolitical competitiveness and security and our values as a nation. And so this is why we have to get it right. So it's interesting because um, uh, when I was going to school, the idea was that um, sort of um, the more literate a society became, the more educated they became, the more open they became, the more likely they were to become a democracy, right? And China was kind of always an example. Maybe if they're if there are fewer poor people there and they're more literate, that ultimately they'll demand more. But interestingly, um, AI has uniquely, and very low-tech AI as it relates to surveillance, empowered communist regimes, right? It empowers a totalitarian um, uh, 
level of control that 30 years ago, I'm not sure anybody could really foresee. And that's certainly what they've capitalized on, to your point. And, and if people think that that is a way to maintain power, which has been the way of the world in many places, um, you're right. Um, you know, they become the dominant player in this. I do want to just shift with a little bit of the time they have left. Um, and anybody, please chime in on this point. Um, but I'll start with you, Mr. Thier, again. Big tech versus little tech here. There, I think there's a, there's a concern, at least that I have, that a regulatory scheme or we're doing something that sort of protects the big players but ultimately leaves out the innovation, again, that got us to this point now. How, would, how do you view this and what can we do to guard against that? Because I do think there are some folks that want a more sort of a protectionist view of the big players here and they have all the answers and they're very important players but not the only players. And how do you guard against this shutting out little tech in this uh, process? Amen to that. Uh, so let's take a look at Europe. I mean, uh, one of the things I always ask my students or, or crowds that I talk to about AI policy or technology policy is I say, name me a leading digital technology innovator headquartered in European Union today. Silence, right? That has everything to do with getting policy wrong. And what European Union is doing right now, the only thing they're exporting on the digital technology front is regulation. And basically, that's all they've got left. And they're trying to regulate mostly large American tech companies. And so what's ironic about their regulatory regime is it was meant to sort of like keep things more in check and competitive, but there's only a handful of large technology companies that can comply with those rules and regulations. We don't want that to happen in the United States. We have thousands upon thousands of small entrepreneurial uh, companies starting up in the AI space right now. And this is the hope for the future, especially open source technology. Mm -hmm. You know, right here in America, that's happening on the ground. We have got to preserve that entrepreneurial, you know, freedom to innovate kind of model for the United States so we don't become the innovation backwater that is the European Union. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so I guess I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Thayer. Um, the bill that I just mentioned takes a risk-based approach that recognizes different levels of regulation are appropriate for different uses of AI. Do you agree that a risk-based approach to regulation is a good way uh, to put in place some guardrails? Yeah, absolutely. I wrote a paper about your bill, Senator. And I, uh, Maybe I know that. <laughs> it's a kind of a softball beginning. Yes. Well, I, I love building on the NIST framework, right? Because that, that exists and it was a multi-stakeholder, widely agreed to set of principles for AI risk management. And so it's really good to to utilize the sort of existing sort of regulatory infrastructure we already have and build on that first. Mm -hmm. Very good. Does it make a difference in our world um, that, what was it, three weeks ago, Apple finally got its next generation of watch to for cardiac uh, arrhythmias, those things, um, substantially certified as a medical device. Is that what you were talking about, that the next generation disruption is coming? Yeah, absolutely. And to answer your question, Congressman, about how we essentially sell these benefits, we talk about it in terms of opportunity costs. Like, what would we be losing? So what kind of foregone innovation would we lose if we don't get this right? Well, we can put our numbers on this. Let's talk about some of the biggest killers in America today. 800,000 people lose their lives to heart disease. 600,000 people lose their, their lives to cancers every year now. I mean, how about, how about cars? Let's talk about public health and vehicles. I mean, every single day, there's 6,500 people injured on the roads in America. 100 of them die. 94% of those are attributable to human error behind the wheel. I have to believe that if we had more autonomy in the automobile sector, we could actually make a dent, excuse the pun, in that death toll. Yeah, and <laughs> so I mean, th this is where we can talk to the public about like the real world trade-offs at work if we get this wrong, right? I mean, we've had a 50-year war on cancer that goes back to the time when, when Richard Nixon was in office. And, you know, we've made some strides, but we could make a lot more if we had serious, robust technological change to bring to bear on this through the form of computational and algorithmic learning. I mean, this is where we can make the most difference. I mean, could, could I just uh, it wholeheartedly endorse uh, what Dr. Howard had to say about uh, digital literacy, AI literacy, because this is really important. First of all, Representative Rochester has a really nice bill on, on uh, digital AI literacy that I think we should take a look at. That's really good stuff. Um, and when we talk about this, you know, AI literacy, digital literacy, we're talking about, you know, learning for life. You know, no matter what kind of uh, punches come at us, we can roll with those punches and figure out how to adapt when we know more about the technology. It's about building resiliency, societal and individual resiliency. And, you know, people sometimes laugh at this. I was on a, uh, I was a co-chair of an uh, uh, Obama administration online safety and security task force where like the only thing anybody in the room could agree on was the importance of 
digital etiquette and literacy. Uh, so there's a lot of agreement on this. This is a good place to start. It's a good foundation for building that resiliency. Um, and some people will say, well, that's not enough. Okay, fine, we'll find other remedies. But it can go a long way. You know, I'm old enough to remember the problems we had in this country with littering and forest fires back in the 60s and 70s. And I remember well, I'm sure some of you up there too uh, as well, that, you know, give a hoot, don't pollute. We addressed that, right? We, we went after Woodsy, you know, Woodsy the Owl and things like that with Smokey the Bear and forest fires. We we made a huge difference just with societal education about the problems of littering and forest fires, right? That wasn't a law that passed. That, that was actual societal learning. It was wrong to throw things out your window of your car, right? So you apply that mentality to the world of like digital and AI policy, and we talk about, again, AI etiquette, netiquette, if you will, like proper behavior, using algorithmic services and technologies, using LLMs, using you know well, these systems. Yes, I, go ahead.